But the, the argument part of the book is to try to explain that if you like Roe v. Wade, if you think this is what the court ought to be doing, and you don't like Bush v. Gore, you can't have it both ways, that that's hypocritical. The most dangerous branch. Publishers Weekly calls it a passionately argued and credible indictment of the court. And famed lawyer and Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz writes, this is a book for our times. Read it and start worrying, then demand change. We're so pleased to host this event here at Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me in welcoming David Kaplan. I want to try to make as much trouble as I can from the outset, but let me ask, by a show of hands, who here thinks that Roe v. Wade was an example of the court at its best. This was what constitutional law should be, by a show of hands. Roe v. Who, who thinks Roe v. Wade was good? Oh, all right, so they, well, already we have no ones. Keep your hands up, that this was the court um, um, behaving as it should. Now, keep your hands up. How many of you think Ro, uh, Bush v. Gore did the same thing? All the hands come down. Now, maybe I didn't ask the first, the Roe v. Wade part of the question exactly right, but the point I'm trying to make is that I often, and I would have expected, certainly in San Francisco, and I would have sort of expected about the same answer in Cambridge, most hands go up. We like Roe v. Wade, but we don't like Bush v. Gore. You rarely find folks who think both represent the court at its best. And the, my book, is really uh, two parts, but, but the, the argument part of the book is to try to explain that if you like Roe v. Wade, if you think this is what the court ought to be doing, and you don't like Bush v. Gore, you can't have it both ways, that that's hypocritical. Y you may have preferred to have Al Gore as your president, and you may think that abortion ought to be a right for uh, women. But that's a different question. That result is a different question for whether the court ought to be the branch of government to grant that right. It is a very difficult argument to try to convince people of. I mean, Alan Dershowitz, the aforementioned Alan Dershowitz, has literally been voted off the island, Martha's Vineyard, you know, because of his views on, uh, uh, on Trump and, and defense of Trump um, every night on cable. I haven't been voted off any island. I don't have a place at Martha's Vineyard, but my own wife hates this book. Um, and while well, she edited it, uh, she's always my first reader, um, under some degree of protest, because she wanted to know, why do I want to help make your book better? And she largely disagrees with the book's views on Roe v. Wade. I'm... I'm a bleeding heart liberal by small c constitution. Um, I think abortion should be legal. I'm in favor of extremely liberal uh, abortion laws. I just don't think the court ought to be the one to award that right. And just as I don't think the court should have been the branch of government to decide a presidential election, just as I think the court shouldn't have gotten involved in Citizens United, throwing out uh, the heart of the camp, uh, campaign finance regulation adopted in 2002, McCain-Feingold, just as I think the court shouldn't have thrown out the District of Columbia's handgun law by finding in the Second Amendment an, uh, an individual right, a constitutional right, to own a handgun in your home for self-defense. And same with case in 2015 that largely gutted the Voting Rights Act passed by Congress a generation, two generations, ago, and that has led to all kinds of voter ID laws and other uh, voter suppression techniques, especially in the South. I, and I argue more tentatively in the book that much as I think the same-sex marriage case probably was correctly decided, there probably is a constitutional right, not sure, but that the court shouldn't have found it in 2015. The court would have been better off waiting and allowing state legislatures across the country to reach that conclusion themselves. It's an argument, it's an argument in favor of a more minimalist, more deferential court. Why? It's not a theoretical 
argument alone. I argue in the book that the problem with an overly interventionist, aggressive, arrogant court, is four problems. One, it hurts the court's prestige. Ultimately, the court relies on its power through its own persuasive, uh, its own powers of persuasion. Unlike Congress, which has the power of the purse, and the presidency, which has the power uh, of the sword, as the hip-hop guy Hamilton argued way back in The Federalist, and Hamilton called the court the least dangerous branch. The title's a play on that. He said it was the least dangerous branch because it ultimately couldn't accomplish anything unless it could persuade the other branches and the people that what it was doing was right. I argue that the book's standing has gone down. It's higher than the presidency. It's certainly higher than Congress, but if you look, for example, over the last 20 years, perhaps since Bush v. Gore, can't necessarily tie it to Bush v. Gore, the court's standing in public opinion bowls has gone down. It's about 45, 50%. Not, it, it, and it has been much higher in other periods of American history. So it hurts the court's own legitimacy. Number two, it helps to enfeeble Congress. Why is Congress so bad? Part of it is because we repeatedly elect chuckleheads to Congress. But part of the problem that Congress doesn't do anything is because it knows that across the street, over at the Supreme Court, the justices are going to have the last word on so many issues. Gun control, voting rights, and of course in Bush v. Gore, the ultimate decision where Congress was designated in the Constitution, in the 12th Amendment, and by statute, a law passed by Congress after the Hayes-Tilden uh, uh, dispute, the tie in, the, in 1876, even though the Constitution itself and a statute designated Congress to resolve a tied presidential election, the court, when asked, intervened. It didn't have to. It could have been a high moment, uh, a proud moment for the court to explain to the American people that there are some issues, like the determination of the presidency, that are not up to the court. Um, and yet it ignored explicit language in the Constitution designating Congress. You know, Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, uh, in years after, in speeches and TV and, and talk show appearances when he was peddling a book, would explain that the court had to get involved because otherwise the United States would have been the laughing stock of the world. This is Antonin Scalia, the alleged originalist and textualist. And, you know, I've checked my constitution and we have, we have law students from down the road here who've read the constitution more carefully than I. I can't find any laughing stock clause in the constitution, but the court, majority of the court decided it was for them to step in. So, and no congressman, no senator stood up in 2000 to say, excuse us, justices. It's for us to decide. Congress, neither branch of, of, of Congress filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, with the court saying, stay out. And that's because it's pretty much assumed that the court will get involved, because it so often does. Not because it should, but because it can. Third problem. An aggressive, arrogant court distorts presidential elections. 25% of Trump voters, according to public opinion polls, 25% of Trump voters in 2016 said they didn't much like Trump, not personally, they didn't like his politics, his policies, but they voted for him because they thought, as it turned out correctly, that he would do the right thing with the Supreme Court. He would appoint the kind of justices who might serve 20 or 30 years, who would ultimately have control over key issues. And given that the court decides those issues, why not? 20% of Hillary voters said they much like her either, but they thought her brand of justice would be their brand of justice. Do you really want a presidential election turning not on what a president thinks, says, promises on his character or her character, but turning on only how they're going to decide the Supreme Court? And presidential elections have largely become that. 2020 may be a referendum on the court, especially depending on how the next few years go with a resolute conservative majority. And fourth, I think you can argue that part of the reason we have a confirmation circus, like with Kavanaugh, to a lesser extent 
with Gorsuch is because a single vote on the court can determine so much policy, uh, social and, and, and political policy um, in the country. It didn't used to be that way. Uh, Kagan, Elena Kagan, the former dean at Harvard, uh, her vote was reasonably contentious. About a third of the Senate voted against her. Sotomayor, um, about a third. But before those two, Breyer, uh, uh, Ginsburg, Alito, Roberts were largely confirmed uh, with bipartisan support. Ginsburg and Breyer almost unanimously. And, and I argue in the book that one of the reasons um, that kind of bipartisanship, unanimity doesn't exist, it's not because the nominees have necessarily changed. You kind of knew what kind of justice we were going to be getting with RBG and Breyer, but because the stakes have gone up so much. That's the serious argument that the book tries um, to make, but the book also is, for lack of a better word, uh, um, it has a lot of, oh, we won't call it gossip, we'll call it tidbits. It's a, it's a narrative of life inside the court. And I was lucky enough to talk to a majority of the justices, as well as about 70 law clerks, all on the condition that I not identify uh, who I talk to, These were what journalists call on background, or not for attribution. You can use anything I tell you. Uh, you just can't say that you talk to me and you can't quote me. Of course, if Justice X quotes something that Justice Y says, then I can use that if I think it's credible. And I gave all the justices about whom I wrote the chance to respond to various pieces of information in the book, whether it was, uh, I think, the real reason Justice Kennedy retired, because his children told him they saw early signs of memory issues. It wasn't a brazen political move. He wanted Trump to name a successor. It's because his children, were, his children, all three of them, one of whom skews left, two skew right, uh, thought that, he was showing signs of age. Um, I, there's information in the book of why Chief Justice Roberts voted the way that he did uh, in 2012 in the Obamacare ruling that decided 5-4 to uphold the statute. Uh, I, I can talk about uh, uh, the very stuff about all the justice to the extent um, that stuff interests you. I think the, most, the, the two most important tidbits were um, uh, a story about how Justice O'Connor's late husband, shortly after Bush v. Gore, told guests at a charity dinner in Washington, shortly after the ruling, that Sandra Day knew the decision of Bush v. Gore was wrong, that she joined, but she voted that way because she wanted to be able to retire with a Republican in the White House so that she could care for him as he became increasingly ill. You hope in reporting a book to find stories like that, and when they come your way, um, you, you sort of thank the publishing gods. And then there, there's a story about Clarence Thomas about um, how his unpleasantness at his confirmation hearings almost 30 years ago uh, still uh, gnawed him. So a few years ago at, uh, at a private dinner at the court that honors a lower court judge, uh, Gloria Allred, the women's rights lawyer, the prominent feminist, was at the dinner as a guest of someone else. And Thomas saw her and went up to her and said, are you here to serve me with papers? Now, if he said it to be funny, that's pretty funny. He didn't say it to be funny. And of course, it's ridiculous that a lawyer would ever serve papers herself. There, were, there, were, there were, is no outstanding litigation pertaining to Clarence Thomas. The whole thing was ridiculous, but it indicates the degree of anger uh, that Thomas still has. Let, let me maybe prophylactically answer two questions that people often ask. What do they think about the Kavanaugh unpleasantness? They hate it. They think it lowers the standing of the court. I, I, I've been to the court since the book came out. They're obviously all upset about it, but it's not personal to Kavanaugh, and many of them knew Kavanaugh. He's part of the Washington establishment. Elena Kagan hired him to teach at Harvard. He and Roberts briefly served together and so forth. Um, and I think there's no evidence that I have that any of them decided, took sides in the case, and there's all evidence that he's getting along just fine internally, much as Thomas got along initially and ever since. Thomas, in many respects, is the most beloved justice in the building. Law clerks, who even those who remember, 
30, who, who read about events of 30 years ago, every single one of them will say that when they go to lunch with him, every justice takes all the clerks from other chambers out to an individual lunch. They will all say that their time with Thomas was the best. He held court at lunch, was the most entertaining. He brought him back to chambers to show them uh, photographs of his summer RV trip across the country with his wife. So, you know, the fact that he might be unpopular among large parts of the population out there is not coextensive with how he's thought of inside the building. Neil Gorsuch, um, it is said in the court with a smile that he has succeeded in unifying the court, doing the impossible. How so? Everybody hates him. It's an overstatement. Um, but he, he, the rookie didn't know how to behave a year ago, and um, the chief was sort of rankled at that, as, as were others. It's not a big deal, but not a necessarily a go-along, uh, a get-along kind of guy. What's the reaction to the book? I haven't gotten a lot of reaction to the book. Um, some praise for, thank you for taking on um, a difficult issue, but I think the thing that amused me most is one justice told me. I, so I tell a story in the book about how the press office at the court sort of has a rule. You may not photograph the chief justice from behind. And you can't always control that, but when he's being photographed in an event, you can determine where the cameras are placed uh, for the annual photograph and so forth. Why, why does he not like being photographed from behind? Because it shows his bald spot. He's the chief justice of the United States. So it was reported back to me by a justice I just made a social call on uh, after the book came out. The Chief Justice David wants you to know that he doesn't have a bald spot. And I said, just as Obama's inauguration was in fact larger than Trump's, you can look at the photographs, you can see the Chief's bald spot. And why is the Chief Justice of the United States reporting back to me that he doesn't have a bald spot instead of, for example, commenting on the book? I just got a smile from the justice and no response. But it's nice to see that the people you write about might actually be reading part of your book. I, I want to I turn this over um, to some of your questions and others, but um, what, do I, what do I think is the future of the court going forward and what's the hope for the court? There is a conservative majority for the first time since the 1930s. What will the conservatives do? Will they take their majority out for a spin? Yeah, probably. I think you'll see the further gutting of campaign finance uh, regulation, Citizens United, um, and then some. I think you may see the rest of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 declared unconstitutional. Clarence Thomas has, always, has already indicated he would throw out the whole statute. Thomas and Gorsuch have already indicated in dissents when the court has refused to take cases that they would like to see the court extend Second Amendment rights, perhaps to uh, guns in public or perhaps concealed guns in public. So there are a variety of areas of federal power. The, most importantly, I argue in the book, it's the power of the, the administrate, what, what, uh, um, what geeks refer to as the uh, federal uh, regulatory state, the administrative state, the power of the EPA to regulate uh, clean water, clean air, uh, the power of OSHA to regulate the workplace. Congress passes broad laws, but it's the agencies that administer those laws day to day. Conservatives for a generation have argued that the deference that the court give, that the courts are supposed to give to those agencies is, is vastly misplaced. And the way to curtail federal power generally is to cut back at that ruling. There are probably five votes for that. It was discussed during the confirmation hearings. It's not as uh, um, sexy as Roe v. Wade, but in terms of changing the country, getting rid of that deference called Chevron deference after a famous 1984 ruling, I think that's potentially the most important ruling to come out that may come out of the court in the next 10 years. What about Roe v. Wade? With the caveat that my predictions are always wrong, um, I think Roe v. Wade is technically safe in the sense that you will not find a majority to explicitly overturn it. But what the court has done by and large in, in the last 25 years, not entirely, but by and large, they'll consider a restrictive regulation 
from a state and decide and have to decide is that an undue burden on the constitutional right to abortion if you uphold most regulations like um, a 24-hour waiting period then you're largely cutting back at that constitu constitutional right to abortion even if you don't overturn Roe v. Wade now I think if a, if, a, if a state actually passed a law outlawing abortion entirely, then the court would have to face the issue. But my hunch is that this Chief Justice, and probably Kavanaugh, because I think Kavanaugh skews more to the center than, say, Alito or Thomas or Gorsuch, would go out of their way not to reach that constitutional question, to leave Roe nominally intact. And I, and I think that's because, in many respects, and you certainly saw this in Roberts last week, gratuitously. There was no need for it. He was asked for comment by the Associated Press. Taking on Trump, really for the first time, I think this Chief Justice, more than any particular issue, and he's a conservative, don't mistake him for a moderate. Um, he was a move, he's been a movement conservative his entire adult life. He worked in the Reagan White House, he worked in the Reagan Justice Department. But more important than his own views on campaign finance regulation or the Voting Rights Act, getting rid of preferences and hiring or admissions, I think he loves the institution. He showed that in the Obamacare ruling. I think he thought it was a close case and ultimately decided he didn't want the court in the center of a political storm all the more in a presidential election year. And I think it is possible uh, that this Chief Justice will try to put the brakes on conservative aggression and maybe keep the court out entirely. We'll just vote not to take certain cases. We'll let stay on the lower court rulings, or we will issue minimalist rulings. The problem with that view is, if I'm wrong about Kavanaugh, then you may already have four votes to take on a lot of those cases. It only takes four votes out of the nine to decide to hear a case. The court controls its own docket. They decide what cases they want to hear. They have to, they have to hear almost nothing. But I think those are the chief's instincts. Um, we'll see how it plays out. Looking ahead a few years, whatever happens with RBG, and people say she's fine, um, uh, she's back to work. Breyer's health, um, from all that is said, is robust. He's turning 80. But what happens to the court longer term. There's talk of what about term limits? Let's get rid of life tenure. I would argue it's dead on arrival. It takes a constitutional amendment and the party in power, now the Republicans, maybe it'll be the Democrats in, in, in two or three years, I don't think we'll ever cede um, that power and agree to a constitutional amendment. And who knows what, if you could get three quarters of state legislatures. I think the more likely reform, if you could call it that, is that if the Democrats take the Senate, keep the House, and win the White House, you might see serious discussion of packing the court. To increase the membership of the court only takes an act of Congress, takes a, takes a bill signed by the President. It was briefly raised by FDR in 1937 and was dead on arrival. Uh, bipartisan objections. It didn't really have to go anywhere because the court quickly whether because of the court packing idea or independently start reverse course and started to uphold New Deal legislation. So FDR largely got what he wanted. In our hyperpolarized times, I think it is possible that the Democrats who are really bad at being bad, I mean, they just don't play hardball as well as Republicans do. I, I think it is possible that the Democrats might get their act together and get through a bill that would increase court membership, say, to 11. Take back the seat that was stolen by us when Merrick Garland was blockaded, when Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland was blockaded by Republicans. Uh, undo Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. If, if the court stays at its current membership, you appoint two liberals, um, you now have a liberal majority. Of course, in the long run, when the Republicans take power, they could just increase the size of the court to 13. At a certain point, you're going to need a bigger building. And at a certain point, it becomes absurd. But I would argue tentatively, and I've reached this conclusion since I wrote the book, um, maybe an afterword for the paperback, but I've come to the conclusion tentatively that it may be to save the institution, you've got to burn it down first. And court packing would be disastrous 
I think, in the short term. It would lay bare the, the politicization of the institution. People think the court is politicized, is partisan. I don't think it is partisan. I think they make an attempt, maybe successful, maybe not, to try to rise above their own partisan views and to try to act like judges. The public doesn't always see it that way, and the public, as I noted at the outset, gets outcome confused with process. You can think abortion should be legal and widely available and still think the Supreme Court ought not be the branch of government to grant that right. You can have more faith in democracy. Um, but I think in the long run, if you saw court packing hurt the court, maybe both sides will come together, if not in five years, in 25, and realize that the temperature has to be lowered and uh, both sides have to stop seeing the court as merely a super legislature, as proxy for what legislators do. And in the first instance, the court may have to decide, as Roberts tentatively tried to do so late in the day after saying nothing for two years in the, in, in the Trump presidency, um, to try to push back a little. He has the station and the stature as the chief to try uh, to do so. Um, but I'm not especially uh, hopeful for the institution. Um, this is not a particularly optimistic book, but it tries to raise the large question, why do you want a court? What's the purpose of the institution? And if all it does is ratify what's taking place in the political majorities below, whoever the president is, that justice will follow uh, uh, the views of that president on purpose or otherwise, why do you want to have the court at all? I argue that rather than granting particular rights, abortion here, same-sex marriage there, the right to own a gun, what the court really ought to be doing is trying to establish guardrails on the process of democracy. I don't want an impotent court. I don't want a do-nothing court. The court is correctly called the most powerful court in the history of the world. But what it ought to be doing, like in cases of partisan gerrymandering, is trimming the sails of democracy run amok. So the court has said for 50 years that racial gerrymandering is unconstitutional, violates the 14th Amendment's Equal, uh, uh, equal Protection Clause. But on partisan gerrymandering, where Democrats in control of the legislature when it comes time to redistrict in the state, draw all these serpentine lines to keep the Democrats in power, just as the Republicans do in Republican states. And the court has long ducked that issue, saying that's just what politicians do. Instead of doing what I would argue they should do, is reining in the political branches in a way that the political branches will never rein in themselves. You can't expect the party in power to redistrict in a way that would hurt them. And people thought that this year would be the year that they would finally do something. Justice Kennedy has said in prior opinions, give me the right kind of test or remedy, and maybe I'll vote with the majority. And Kennedy largely this year phoned it in. He backed down. He ducked the issue. Why? I don't really know, but I think you can speculate that he pretty much was done. He was tired. He was a very uninfluential justice this last um, term. I say that tentatively. The problem is that unless Kavanaugh has that view on partisan gerrymandering, and there's no information what he thinks either way, um, partisan gerrymandering is lost for at least another generation. And I think that just underscores what the court's problem is. It gets involved when it ought to, and it doesn't get involved when it should. Um, we should go to questions. With Justice Kennedy on the court, uh, um, a case out of Texas a couple of years ago, he, he sided um, with proponents of affirmative action, but that was an odd case, um, and it was unusual that Kennedy voted that way. Which way Kavanaugh hasn't done a lot below, um, I wouldn't be betting a lot of money um, if you're in favor of affirmative action. I think you'll see, certainly if Roberts' view, Roberts doesn't like those preferences, and if I were a betting man, with my caveat, I I, w I think Kavanaugh's ascension um, is, is, is bad for future affirmative action cases. By the way, how, how will Kavanaugh um, work within the court? 
um, all evidence is that he's doing just fine. I think a lot of the prognostications that he, he will have problems among his colleagues um, are, um, there's no basis for it. And I also think the notion, um, and I've known Kavanaugh for a decade. I've sat next to him at rubber chicken dinners. Um, I don't profess to know um, a whole lot about the fellow, but I think the notion that even if this Trump White House chose him because they thought of how he might vote on a Robert Mueller, on a case involving uh, the Russia investigation, even that might, Lord knows what's in this president's head, if anything's in this president's head, but even if Don McGahn thought that's how Kavanaugh would vote, and the two of them are very close, Kavanaugh s swore um, uh, McGahn in when he headed the Federal Election Commission, I, I think that underestimates um, uh, Kavanaugh. I'd be very surprised um, if he didn't, wasn't in the mainstream of whatever else uh, uh, the court rules. And, and without getting into necessarily the psychology a whole lot, I would guess he'd be loath to appear to be doing the bidding of the president who, the president who appointed him. He will not recuse himself. Um, it's very, justices usually don't recuse themselves because unlike all other courts where you can find somebody else to take your place, there are no replacement for Supreme Court justices. So they're very reluctant um, to stay out of a case. That lowers the court to eight justices, the possibility of ties. I think the notion that Kavanaugh will stay out of that kind of case or sexual harassment case are virtually nil. What else did I answer? I don't want to draw too much of a straight line. You know, as a journalist, journalists see two points and immediately draw a straight line. At Newsweek, we do that all the time. This book tries to be a little more nuanced, and there have been times when the court has been extremely aggressive. Dred Scott, probably the worst decision in the history of the court, helped lead to the Civil War, middle of the 19th century. The court, in striking down all kinds of um, economic legislation, uh, minimum wage, maximum hours, uh, from... 1905 into the New Deal period, where the court said there was an economic liberty uh, that trumped, no pun intended, uh, uh, um, statutes passed by states and Congress. And I think you may see, particularly with Clarence Thomas, um, an invocation of those doctrines. I mean, what's the difference between economic liberty and personal liberty? It just depends on whether you have five votes. You know, as Justice Brennan, the great liberal justice of the court from the 50s to the 90s, liked to say, said it once to me in an interview, around here you can do anything with five votes. All it takes is five. I mean, it's real politic at a certain um, level. So the court has had periods of adventurism or aggressiveness. But I think after the Warren Court of, of, of the 50s and the 60s, beginning with Brown against the Board of Education, outlawing... Uh, uh, segregation public schools, and I would argue was the court at one of its finest moments. Language clearly in the 14th Amendment, maybe not the world's greatest opinion. If you go back and read Brown against the Board of Education, it's just 12 paragraphs. It reads like a speech delivered from the well of the Senate. It doesn't really read like a legal opinion, but it was intentionally so. Chief Justice Warren wanted there to be less for the, for the country. He wanted a result, but he, didn't want, he wanted less language that maybe the country would, 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 would pick apart. But I think the courts, for lack of a better term, activism in the 50s, 60s, emboldened uh, uh, the court going into the 70s. I don't much like the term activism. Activism is what the other guy does. Everybody believes in judicial deference, except when they don't. In truth, I think everybody's an activist now. It just depends on what cases. When I would meet with justices, they would ask me to summarize what the book was about because they didn't necessarily remember from email or the letter that I had sent, and I would explain to them what the court's about, and I had one, li one of the liberals, they're not always liberal, but I had one of the liberals, one of the conservatives, each say to me with a smile, well, I half agree with your argument, and that's the problem. I mean, they, they each agreed with the different half of the cases, and very few of them really wanted to try to take the position that the court is too involved. It was quite striking how many of them would say in conversation, are you paying any attention? Look across the street at Congress. They all 
have disdain for Congress, and most of them have disdain for who's president. How can you not? And I think their view is somebody's got to be an adult in the country. And while I understand that sentiment, I would argue that if we chose this president and this Congress, that's what we get. If you don't like who you elected, elect somebody else. Elections of consequences and that the court ought not be in the position of saving us from ourselves. And while I don't know that you could, you could argue that maybe there were, this, you could pick apart various decisions in the 60s under the Warren Court, but I really marked it at the beginning um, at Roe v. Wade. And by the way, just to get myself in further trouble, I think Roe was wrongly decided. But if you want to know about consequences, I think you can argue that but for Roe v. Wade, you never would have had Reagan. Once upon a time, we had moderate Republicans, Rockefeller Republicanism. And Reagan's rise in the 70s and the rise of the evangelical right, you can mark to, to Roe v. Wade. It took seven years. But I think you can argue that the backlash to Roe helped create the modern Republican Party. That's not a winning argument, in my view, that Roe is bad law. I think Roe is bad law for other reasons. But if you want to know what the problem is, even if you are a supporter of abortion rights, do you like what became of the Republican Party? I think that largely um, is due to Roe. Anyway, that's a chapter of the book that that one in particular um, infuriated my wife, who's fortunately not here to defend herself. I think Bush v. Gore, I would, I, I, just for entertainment, I brought up Bush v. Gore with all of them. It's the third rail for all of them. Because I mean, most of them weren't on the court then. But at some level or other, mostly body language, eye rolls, um, I think they all recognized that Bush v. Gore was not a particularly proud moment for the court. Now, Scalia would tell you, terrible opinion. But we had to, you know, we had an hour to write a couple of days to write the opinion, and we had to save the country from itself, which, of course, is ridiculous. The Constitution s sets up what you do, and we, we would have eventually had a president, probably by January 20th, but if we didn't, there's an app for that. It, you know, the Speaker of the House would have become president. There's a constitutional amendment that provides for an acting president if Congress picks picks them. Bill Clinton, I'm pretty sure, would have been happy to hang around a few extra weeks. And I think, I mean, I think the outcome of Bush v. Gore, the House would have, the House would have chooses the presidency, chooses the president, and the Senate picks the vice president. The Senate was tied 50-50. The, the, the president of the Senate at the time was the vice president, as it turned out, Al Gore. I think you, the outcome, if it ever reached Congress, would have been, Bush would have been president, and Lieberman would have been chosen as the vice president. You would have had the first real coalition government in American history. And I think that actually would have struck a lot of Americans as rough justice, as the compromise in what essentially was a tied election. Again, that's not a reason why Bush v. Gore was wrong. But I think in terms of outcome, if you care about outcome, um, that's the most likely result. I don't think they view themselves as roving do-gooders, but they are aware of the outcome, the practical results of decisions they reach, and different justices uh, will, who live in the real world, I think will take that into account. But no, I don't think they think of them as politicians who have to go out there and solve um, the problem with coal or the problem with clean water. And of course, there is a limit to what cases they can, they can hear. A case has to be brought to them. And there's a lot of talk in 
in democratic litigation circles now, among activists, uh, among uh, de uh, uh, litigation uh, groups, whether it's the now Legal Defense Fund or the ACLU, of trying to avoid the Supreme Court. If you lose in a lower court, don't appeal. If you don't appeal, then the bad guys who won in the lower court can't bring it to the Supreme Court. They won. That's a practice that's taken place throughout the modern era. That, uh, that, that if you think you're going to lose at the Supreme Court, don't give them the chance to nationalize uh, and, and, and issue a decision that will have more harm than only one uh, lower federal court. But I think most justices will tell you that they don't think the way that you articulated um, in your question. Uh, and of course, to the extent that they do, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's views on individual liberties, whether it's gender discrimination um, or racial discrimination, are very different than what Clarence Thomas's views would be about economic freedom. I mean, I mean Clarence Thomas, who does not have much respect for uh, stare decisis, for precedent, he thinks that if the decision was wrong, on the day it was issued, it should be overturned. That's his view. Gorsuch's view probably skews in that direction. But Thomas probably believes that a lot of the laws coming out of the New Deal should be struck down, that there's an economic liberty right, so that if somebody wants to build a smelting plant in your neighborhood, they probably should, that zoning laws are unconstitutional, and all manner of regulating business infringes on the business's economic liberty. I mean, that's the trouble with viewing liberty so broadly. Remember, Roe v. Wade wasn't a decision about equal protection. Ginsburg has said subsequently that maybe the decision would have been better grounded as a decision about equal protection, and I think she's right. But that decision was about the liberty interest of women. Fair enough. The trouble is, liberty is a pretty broad concept. And for 20 or 30 years, the Supreme Court thought that what was most important about liberty were economic rights. That's the trouble with an elastic, the Constitution has broad language. It's not, you know, a statute with spelled out um, uh, a right. It talks about due process, talks about equal protection, talks about problem. It has that kind of broad language. But if it means almost anything to what five justices say it does, you have a court that runs the country. And, I, and the point of the... Part of what the book argues is that that's a bad thing. I mean, I've gotten some grief for is it really the most dangerous branch when a president, say the current one, can blow up the world? Sure, the president can do lots of long-term immediate damage, but I would argue that over the long term, at a more insidious level, um, uh, the court does more harm because it does harm to itself and, as I said at the beginning, does, har uh, does harm to Congress and state legislatures and to people's faith in democracy. I don't much like what democracy has wrought in recent years. You know, in a perfect world, I'd be the monarch. But that's not the system. So I guess at, at an ideological level or philosophical level, I'd ultimately take my chances with more democracy rather than less democracy. And that's not what, what the modern court is in the business um, of executing. Yes. Five votes, you could do anything around here. By the way, I mean, Brennan, was a, everybody would argue that Brennan was an influential, great justice, whether you agree or not. But as somebody once pointed out about Brennan during the heyday of the Warren Court, he started with seven votes. So it's not hard to come up with five when you start with seven. Maybe he wasn't quite as influential within the place. As, I mean, there's a, it's greatly overestimated how influential any one justice can be. There isn't horse trading. It's not a markup at, at, at a House Senate um, conference, but you know, I had trouble with Citizens United. I think it's a closer case than I went in thinking. I think that money can be equated um, with speech. So I thought it was a tough case, but I ultimately concluded that even if it's a tough case, give the legislature the benefit of the doubt. And if Congress, in its infinite wisdom, 
decided that actual corruption or the appearance of corruption was a harm that needed to be addressed by Congress, give them the benefit of that. In the same way, there are a lot of aspects of the Voting Rights Act that places a burden on certain states, mostly in the South, that are unfair. I would, I would sympathize with some states which think they're treated as second-class citizens based on uh, historical data that is, that is way dated. But I would give the benefit of the doubt to Congress to make those decisions. And if you don't like what Congress is doing, get new congressmen and get new senators. M my other problem with Citizens United, and, and uh, this is less to do with the actual ruling, is it is often, we often lament the role of big money in politics. I I've always had a problem with it because it assumes that the most money buys you an election. If you vote for the candidate who has the most ads on during the football game, you're an idiot. You have only yourself to blame. If you can't spend enough time to decide which of the candidates you support based on reading some position statements or doing something other than adding up the number of moronic ads you watched, I would argue that's not the fault of big money. That's not the fault of the lack of regulation. That's your fault. Well, I mean, exactly. Again, I... I, I an uninformed electorate for the 50% who vote. You also have an uninformed unelectorate. But hey, that isn't the fault of Citizens United. It threw out parts of the McCain-Feingold um, statute of 2002 and made it easier for corporations and other entities, labor unions, to band together to contribute. It did not, as is often said, create big money in politics. The formation of super PACs could be done without Citizens United. You'll, I will not get a full night's sleep if I try to give you a longer explanation because trying to unwrap what was in the statute occupied a miserable couple of months in the book. The book, I think, does a reasonably good job of trying to explain what the decision did and what it didn't do. But blaming Citizens United for the ills of big money in the country is vastly overstated. It's more by way of being um, symbolic. And by the way, somebody asked me a question um, earlier today, is um, when Chief Justice Roberts criticized Trump, how's that any, and, and, and and of course, Trump was, was roundly criticized for his views. How is that any different than Barack Obama criticizing the Supreme Court to its face at the State of the Union address in 2010, right after Citizens United came down? And it's an interesting comparison. I don't have any problem with presidents criticizing the court. I think the big difference um, in the examples is Obama's criticism of Citizens United was at worst reasonable. Trump's criticism of the Ninth Circuit was idiotic. At some point, what you say can be evaluated based on you know, whether it's true or false, reasonable um, or unreasonable. Um, but but I, you know, I, 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 and my view on, Ro I thought it was great that Roberts would try to take on Trump, but where was Roberts six months ago and a year ago and two years ago? I'd love to find out and sorry I can't report to you why he, why he decided to speak up now. Longer discussion, but there is an argument that even though a corporation is an invention of, a, of the state, it only exists by statutes, not in the Constitution, but there is an argument to be made that once you create something, it does have some rights. The question is, are they, can those, how much can those rights be regulated by the entity, by the legislature that created. That's in the book, shockingly enough. Roberts, when, the justices, when after they hear oral argument, oral argument, go to conference. Only they attend, it's this inner sanctum of the court, just the nine justices, um, and they, they, they take an initial vote on, on, on cases. Then that's also when they vote on what cases to take. Roberts, it was clear that there were four votes to overturn the Affordable Care Act and four votes to uphold it. Roberts, 
as Chief Justice, who always goes last, it's, it's a great gig for any number of reasons. He once said that one of the oddities, though, of the Constitution is that the Chief only gets one vote. Um, it's just him cracking wise. And he initially said, voted to overturn the statute based on Commerce Clause grounds. We don't need to get into what that means. But he immediately went back to Chambers, and this is what's new that's in the book. He immediately went back to Chambers and asked his law clerks, ordered his law clerks, to write two different opinions, striking down the law on commerce grounds, but, over, but upholding it on, the, on the, the taxing power in the Constitution. Again, we can talk about it after class. But when he saw the two drafts, because he clearly was ambivalent, when he saw the two drafts, he decided, as judges often say, that the one throwing out the statute didn't write. It wasn't persuasive. And he, the next conference, a couple of weeks later, he went back and said, I'm changing my vote. And there were unprecedented leaks from the court that the chief had been pressured by liberal commentators and columnists and that he was uh, 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 a traitor to the conservative cause. But that's what was going on in Robert's mind. And some of that you can sort of read between the lines of the opinion. He clearly didn't like the statute. He thought it was terribly drafted. He was right. What isn't in the opinion, and you just, and it's a matter of supposition, um, but I think there's a good basis to believe that he decided as an institutional matter that in the middle of a presidential election year, you did not want the court striking down the signal statute of the, Ob of the Ob Obama's first term in a five to four vote six months before an election, because that would place the court in the center of a storm. I would argue that's politics, judicial politics in the best sense of the word. I mean, there's, there's a principle of constitutional law that if you can uphold a statute, there's a way to find it constitutional, you do so, even if there may be a perfectly reasonable way to declare it unconstitutional. And that was Robert's being a statesman. You know, I tell a story in the book where he's going to lunch with some law clerks, and one of them says, how do you like the job? And you sort of expect him to say something like, well, you know, I'm only the 17th. There have been 44, 45 presidents. It's a great gig. I'm so proud. And what he said was, which was quite remarkable, he says, I love the job, but I'll never have the chance to be great. There was only one great Chief Justice, the great John Marshall, who was Chief Justice for 30 some odd years at the beginning of the 19th century, and who established the principle of judicial review, the idea that the, the Supreme Court could strike down an act of Congress, which isn't in the Constitution. I mean, that's, judges and senators often like to say judges shouldn't make law. Of course they make law. And the notion that Congress can strike down an act of Congress, that Supreme Court can strike down uh, an act of Congress as unconstitutional, is making it up. It's reasonable. It's a good structural argument that you need to have that check or else the Supreme Court's entirely impotent. But Marshall created that, and lots of books have been written about it. And Roberts here is lamenting. He already is thinking. He's only been on the court five years. He's barely 60. He's thinking about his place in history. I would argue that in the Obamacare ruling, he demonstrated what greatness looks like, and which is why I argue that he might be the hope of the court. Would I place a lot of money on it? No. <laughs>